Today's episode of the No-Till Market Garden Podcast is brought to you by Growers & Co. One of the most exciting developments in recent years is that, thanks to Jean-Martin Fortier, the market gardener, there is now a clothing, tool, and apparel company that was built for exactly the type of work we talk about on this show. I know that I've personally grown a little bit tired of looking through workwear websites and catalogs built for fishing or carpentry to find what I need for market gardening. So I was thrilled when Growers & Co. came to fruition and even more thrilled when I tried their clothing. They have done absolutely excellent work. Their clothing is well-made and well-fitted. The tools are designed by growers and made to last. There is also a magazine that Growers & Co. is putting out twice per year with a focus on small farming but also that represents the dignity, skills, and creativity required to do this work. They have a straw hat that I'm a little obsessed with. I've talked about it a lot. Not going to lie. It's on the cover of my book. Anyway, follow Growers & Co. on Instagram and all the places and check out what they have to offer at growers.co. Today's show is also brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors power dozens of professional quality PTO-driven attachments for soil working, mowing, property maintenance, snow removal, and more. BCS tractors are famous for their durability and versatility with handlebars that rotate 180 degrees for front and rear mount implements. And now, BCS has introduced a game changer in the two-wheel tractor world, Model 770 with hydrostatic drive. Model 770's easy grip lever enables the operator to precisely select ground speed and direction of travel without the need to shift or vary the throttle. This is extremely useful for heavy mowing or snow clearing jobs where constant changes in direction or speed are necessary. Now you can keep the flail mower running at full RPM while you mow forward, reverse, and forward again, all without the need to shift or re-engage the PTO. The Hydrostatic Model 770 is on sale now. Check out bcsamerica.com for sale pricing and to find your nearest dealer. That's bcsamerica.com. Huge thanks to our show sponsors. Now, let's jam. Hey, you all, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to the No-Till Market Garden Podcast, Episode 17, Season 3. I am super excited about today's episode. I caught up with Bob and Ann Patton of Hexhamshire Organics across the pond over there in England to talk about a farm they started in their late 50s, but not as a hobby. They started a production market garden with an eye on profit after years in other industries, and they have succeeded. Bob and Ann have employed lessons they've learned from their past careers to streamline their no-dig operation. We talk about their really fascinating approach to bed width. We talk about expanding the garden and production to meet demand. We talk about winter growing and a whole lot else. Such a great episode, and I think there's so much to take away from their approach. Before we get into it, over the last year and a half, I poured an unbelievable amount of time into writing a book, which will be out this July, but it is on pre-order now at notillgrowers.com. Proceeds from that sale go to funding the work we do at No-Till Growers. So just so that's clear, I get a royalty from the publisher or whatever, but I do not keep any of the money from that sale at No-Till Growers. All of that goes into the creative budget. The book is called The Living Soil Handbook, The No-Till Growers Guide to Ecological Market Gardening. Uh, you can learn more or pre-order it at notillgrowers.com. All right, enough for me. Let's get into this amazing conversation with Bob and Ann Patton of Hexhamshire Organics. Bob and Ann Patton, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Jesse. It is such a pleasure to have you all. So, okay, so we'll start where we always start. Uh, give us a little rundown of the farm. Where are you located and the kind of acreage you're working on there? Okay, uh, so where we are, we're based in, in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, the United Kingdom is made up of many counties. We're in the county of Northumberland. So for uh, people to understand where that is, our farm is 50 miles south of the England-Scotland border. Uh, we're 300 miles north of London. We're in USDA zone nine. In terms of our, our weather conditions, we have sort of reasonably warm summers, but the rest of the time it tends to be wet and windy. Our last frost is in May and our first frost is in October. So we've got a very good uh, grown season uh, across here. 
In terms of the farm itself, it's just over 60 acres. Those 60 acres are split over four fields. In one field, we planted an 80-tree fruit orchard. In another field, we've got pedigree Tamworth peaks. And we have two fields where we grow vegetables. We've got about three quarters of an acre under cultivation at the moment. And that's split between uh, covered and uncovered cropping. We've got 10 hoop houses, which cover a quarter of an acre. Uh, we've got half an acre of uncovered cropping. And we've also got two heated propagation glass houses. As well as the pigs, we also have uh, chickens uh, and uh, we have we, we sell eggs. This year, we want to expand our growing area from three quarters of an acre to one and a quarter acres. That will be in a quarter of an acre of covered cropping and one acre of uncovered cropping. That's great. I'm really, yeah, we definitely have to dive into how you're transitioning or how you're going to open up that acreage. Um, but first, I'm okay. So, what are you doing with in terms of marketing? Like, where's the produce going? Well, until uh, COVID hit, we used to have three revenue streams. Uh, we did markets every weekend. Uh, we did a, a couple of very good restaurants in the region. Uh, one's called Yem, which is a, a few miles from where we are. And the other one is called Cookhouse in our nearest city. Uh, and they both those restaurants have very good reputations. And we operate a box scheme. Uh, I think in the States you call them CSAs. Since COVID happened, two of those revenue streams uh, stopped overnight, the restaurants and the markets. And that left us with just the box scheme. And but within we we announced our first lockdown, uh, the government did in March 2020. Within two weeks of that lockdown being announced, the demand for our, our box scheme doubled. Uh, and that that we've more or less maintained that level of interest in our box scheme all the way through 2020. And then the government announced another lockdown two weeks ago. And following that announcement, uh, the demand went up by another 50 percent. So we typically will uh, send out about 100 boxes a year. A week. Sorry, sorry, a, year, a, week. a week even. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what am I saying? 100 boxes a week. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and they, they tend to go to our surrounding area and we have a city which is about 20 miles from where we live. Uh, it's called Newcastle upon Tyne. Uh, so we deliver to there as well. Yeah, that's great. So there's no market either this year. There was no market in 20, in 2020. Uh, I think our last market was around about February time. Uh, there's been one market uh, set up since then, but we didn't attend it. Uh, we thought from a health and safety point of view, it was best if we didn't. Um, so no market since then. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So, okay. So there's a bunch of stuff I want to talk to you all about. Um, but one of the kind of big themes I want to focus on with you is that I'm really interested in your story on, in terms of, you know, um, I get a lot of questions from folks who are not 20 years old, but are in their forties and fifties and sixties wondering about whether it makes sense to start a farm. So you all did that in your sixties. And moreover, you told me that it's not a hobby farm. So, and as you've just described, so can you talk a little bit about what led to this decision? Yeah. So, yeah, like you said, it's not a hobby farm. We've set, we've set up a proper business here. I mean, we've still got bills to pay. We've still got a mortgage to pay. So it has, it has to work. It has to work financially. Um, so we're, as you said, Jesse, we're, we're both in our 60s uh, and we were approaching 60 and we lived in the city, in uh, the city that's close to us. And at that time, we actually were thinking about retiring. Anne had had a very uh, successful career in catering. Uh, she'd run the best, the best delicatessen in Newcastle. <laughs> so she'd spent 40 years in catering. I'd spent 40 years in technology. Uh, but we did enjoy growing. And uh, we had, I don't know if you have the same terminology across in the States, but we, we have allotments here city allotments where you can go and you know you get a patch of land uh, and you use it to grow veg and we had an allotment um, but at the time we we're approaching 60 and we started looking for a house in the country to retire to and the criteria was we we wanted to find a property 
um, which had something about it, you know, it had some character to it. And we were looking for it to have a little bit of land because we were keen on keep on growing, uh, keep on growing flowers and veg. The area of land we were looking at was you know, maybe it's up to a quarter of an acre. Uh, we actually found the house we were looking for. Uh, it was built in 1792. It's a lovely uh, old house. But instead of the quarter of an acre we were looking for, uh, it came with six and a quarter acres. And the first time we saw the property, we knew we were going to buy it. But as we were looking around the land, I turned to Anne and said, we could turn this into a martyred garden. Because despite being in technology for 40 years, uh, my lifetime ambition has always been to be a martyred gardener. Uh, it's always something I wanted to do when I was growing up, when, when I was uh, just going into my teens. My father always used to take me along to his allotments uh, to, and he used to show me how to grow veg and it was something I've always been interested in. So we said, uh, why don't we do that? In hindsight, we didn't know what we were talking about because whilst we grew, we knew how to grow veg on an allotment, we certainly didn't know how to grow veg on a commercial basis. Uh, we, we didn't know much about uh, cultivation on a, on a larger scale. Uh, but we did, you know, we went out and we, we tried to uh, get as much knowledge as we could. Uh, we read, you know, the Elliot Coleman books, we read GM's book. Uh, and we're four years into running as a market garden. The first two years were a huge struggle. Uh, we inherited some land which had poor soil fertility. We had drainage issues. We had no, at the time when we first started, we had no covered cropping. The land we had was former pasture land. Uh, nothing had really been done on it for decades. It had, uh, as I said, had poor drainage. Uh, it had lots of weeds. And it was a real struggle because no matter what we did, we just seemed to be experts in growing weeds. And we kept on going because we'd both been successful in our previous careers. And we held on to the thought that we would eventually work out how to be successful as market gardeners. Uh, but to be honest, a lot of that was just pure blind faith. I don't think we had a, a real plan as to how we were going to do that. And we just seemed to hit problem after problem after problem. And then the summer of 2018 came along. Uh, in the UK, that was a really hot summer. Uh, and we were, I think we'd start to make some progress, but we still had lots of weeds we had lots of issues with pests. And one day, Anne walked in and said, uh, something's eating our turnips. So we had uh, six rows of turnips along a 100-foot bed. And when, when we both went outside, sure enough, something was eating the turnip leaves. Within a week, all the foliage, foliage of, of the turnips had all been uh, eaten. So Anne, who's really the horticulturist amongst between the two of us, uh, got down on our hands and knees and found out what it was. And it was a little black caterpillar. And we, we and researched it and she identified it was something called a turnip sawfly. I don't know if you've got that sort of thing in the States. Oh, I'm not sure. We don't have it. I've not seen it here. It just, it basically, it's, uh, it tends to, uh, that you tend to get a lot of them on in Europe. And very rarely does it come across the channel into uh, the UK, but it does during periods of really hot weather. Uh, it normally just affects the, the southern counties of England, but in this year it was very hot and it went came as far north as where we are in Northumberland. So we, we were sitting there, standing there looking at all these turnip leaves that had just been decimated. Now we're organically certified, and so our certification bodies, the Soil Association, so I phoned them up the next day and said, we've been attacked by a turn of sawfly, really asked for some advice and guidance on, on what we should do. And the person I spoke to said, look, we've got a small team of experts who cover the whole of the UK. It's called the producer support team. There's, there's three people in the team. I'm going to, they gave us the phone numbers uh, of the three people, one of whom was on holiday. So we were left with two people to phone. Uh, and I just phoned the first number 
explained the situation, said we were Hexhamshire Organics. Uh, our certification number was uh, AB21586. Uh, we'd been attacked by a ton of sawfly, and we were after some advice and guidance on what to do. And the person at the other end of the phone's first words were, are you there this afternoon? Which I, I thought was a bit of a strange response because, as I said, these two people that we were going to call had responsibility for the whole United Kingdom. It turned out that the person we spoke to, who was the soil and crop advisor for the Soil Association for the whole of the UK, lived five miles from where we lived. So it's a guy called Paul Flynn. Uh, he came across in the afternoon. He, he identified and confirmed it was a turnip so fly. Um, but in the conversation, he basically advised, he, he came over and it was obvious he was a soil expert. And at this point, there was a couple of um, things happened, which was which were really uh, circumstantial, which were last, last week, the previous week, we'd had our soil analysed. So when he turned out he was a soil expert, asked him if he would come in and read a soil analysis report, just so we can get some feedback. And he went through the report, he gave us some advice, but he then turned around to myself and Anne and said, if I can give you one piece of advice, stop digging your soil. And we'd heard about no dig or no till, as you call across in the States. We'd heard about Charles Dowden, uh, but we hadn't really gone into it in a great deal of detail. Uh, so Paul explained uh, no dig. Uh, he explained about a deep compost mulch system. And my first words were, but that's going to cost us an awful lot of money in compost because whilst we make our own compost, uh, you know, I didn't think we'd have enough to, to operate a deep compost mulch system. And then he said, have you ever heard of green waste compost? Which I hadn't. And the second bit of good fortune was he came in the afternoon. In the morning, I had a visit from a former colleague who worked in London I uh, was up seeing her family uh, in Northumberland. She lives about five miles from where we are, and they have a farm. And I just happened to say, what sort of farm is it? And she said, it's, it's basically dairy and sheep. However, my brother makes compost. So I didn't think too much of it at that point. So we had somebody telling us in the morning that they made compost, and then somebody coming in the afternoon who was basically saying, stop digging your soil get some compost and go for a deep compost mulch system. So within a day, we'd made the, the decision we were going to move to no dig. We booked ourselves on the Charles Dowden uh, course. We visited his place. Uh, Charles is just absolutely inspirational. His garden is inspirational. And we went for a deep compost mulch system. And it has been the best thing we've, we've done. So when you ask the question, you know, about people in their 40s, 50s and 60s or whether they should do this. Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, 40s and 50s sounds young to us, actually. <laughs> um, but, but especially a deep compost mulch system, because it, it's just been brilliant for us. We have very few weeds. Uh, the soil, the fertility of the soil has just changed incredibly. We have better crops. And after two years of not really knowing what we're doing, uh, hitting problem after problem after problem, having loads of weeds. By year three, we started making a profit. And we'll make a, more of a profit in year four. And it has been by far the best thing we've done. And I think it's also, uh, I mean, I, you know, there's still an awful lot of work to operate uh, a, a no-till deep compost mulch system, but it's nothing compared to uh, digging and plowing uh, so we find it easier. Uh, one, it's easier, but secondly, because you're spending less time in terms of pre prepping the ground, you're spending much less time weeding. You spend more time cropping because you've got more crops. Uh, we've actually found that uh, we can manage it better now. So it, it, it's, it's, it's been brilliant for us. Uh, we do have a team of three people who work on a part-time basis. We have Lucy who works four days a week for us, Graham who works two days a week, and Stu who works one day a week. But we can see the, the sort of direction we're going in 
Uh, I mean, all three are great. We've got a great team. But the direction we're probably going to move into is having two people working with us uh, full time. I mean, we started making a profit a uh, year and a half, two years ago. And if we continue on the trend we're going on at the moment, if we move to a year and a quarter, if we continue to uh, do what we have been doing, we expect in about three or four years' time to um, make up to $100,000 uh, profit a year. Wow, that's great. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great story. And I, and maybe you mentioned it, but did the flies go away once you switched to no dig? Um, so what, what, what they do is um, the, the second bit of advice that Paul gave us was, look, you've lost your crop this year. Um, and what you've got to do is make sure you adhere to a good crop rotation in this area and don't grow brassicas in that area. Because what what the turnip sawfly does, and do you want to explain? Because you understand this better than me. Um, not really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it has uh, two cycles a year, so there's absolutely no way that you're going to be able to get rid of it. So um, the best thing that Bob did was burn the ground, um, and then we just didn't use it for such a long time. Um, it, it it does actually turn into what would be like a blue bottle fly. So it, it would just keep regenerating over and over again. So you just have to really get rid of that land um, the way it is and just bide your time. Yeah, so as Anne says, I got the flame weeder out and really scorched the area where they were. And uh, we, haven't been, we haven't been hit by that problem since. Nice. So you, yeah. you scorched that earth and then you, or scorched, scorched that area and then you covered that with compost? Yes, yes, we did. Yeah. Yeah. And what, okay. So in terms of, I'm just thinking like, and, and forgive me, this is presumptuous, but are you doing things that lessen the workload in terms of the physicality of moving that much compost? So as I say, we, we've got, uh, we're very fortunate in that. I mentioned that uh, a former colleague came in and she advised that her of, of her farm, her family's farm, made compost, green waste compost, municipal compost. So that's about three miles from three or four miles from where we are. So typically, what we will do is we will pick up two tons at a time in on a trailer, and we use a tipping trailer, and we use the tipping trailer just to, if we're covering a, a wide area, we'll use the tipping trailer just to um, spread it out, and then we even it over with. Uh, garden rakes but when we're doing the beds in the hoop houses we make them all by uh, uh, filling the wheelbarrow up and just doing it uh, manually like that and that's worked well for us yeah i think we, what, what you're trying to ask because we're old <laughs> which we are and we feel very old at the end of the day um however the, the learning process keeps you very active so we, we learned an awful lot before we've actually put it into practice. And that is always a good thing when you're getting on. Just because you are getting on, it doesn't mean to say that you can't learn new things. Um, and the other thing is the physical activities also keep you young. They, they, they do hurt, but I think they hurt a 30-year-old as well. You know, the, the active duties that you have to do. But we because we've got... Now we have 10 polytunnels, and we, as well as the outside area, but we've split it up into manageable chunks. So if you look at a polytunnel and you just look at that one polytunnel, it's very easy to manage that and manage your expectations that you can actually successfully do that one polytunnel in a day. The weeds are less, so you know you're, that's been managed. Um, so you can see success quite quickly, which is always encouraging, especially when you are old. Right. And I, you know, and I, I didn't want to ask that question in a way that sounded <laughs> like, like I was calling you old because those, no, no, we are. We are. those issues, I mean, I think about spreading compost. I'm in my late thirties. Um, and that's one of the most exhausting things I do. And it seems to just get a little bit more exhausting. Like in a way it gets a little bit more exhausting every year because it's, it's, uh, a lot of compost to move. And, you know, um, 
I think that I'm stronger in a way, but also like my bones, you know, my back is not as good as it used to be and, and those sorts of things. So I'm wondering, like, as I get older, I'm always looking for things that I should be thinking about or techniques that would maybe save me that energy. Um, and I was kind of curious if you've come across those sorts of things. You do a few things. You find a good chiropractitioner. You do stretching and you lay on the on your back. You know, you, you, you do some exercise. I mean, we try and keep fit, uh, but gardening alone keeps you fit. Um, it, and as you do get older, your mind changes. And you, well, particularly for Bob and I, we're very much determined. We won't let things stop you from doing anything. So success breeds success is what they say. And it's, you know, we think that we're becoming quite successful. And that's because we, we won't let things stop you. And I think you do get that in um, as you get older. And that's experience, I think. I don't know. Life experience. One thing is that Anne touched on there was the fact that we split things up into small chunks. And so we have uh, a lot of our approach is based on planning. So we have an approach in place where we plan tomorrow, today. We plan next week, this week. We plan next year, this year. Uh, we've got uh, a business plan. We have uh, an operational plan for 2021. Uh, we've got a whiteboard in one of our rooms, which covers 15 months, uh, the, the next 15 months. Uh, we know what we're going to grow, where we're going to grow it, uh, and we've got it all planned out. So we know every day what we're going to do, every week what we're going to do, uh, what dates we've, we've got to hit. Uh, so from a planning point of view, the way we start is... Um, there's there's one set of crops which are really critical from a time point of view, and that's our overwintering crops. And we know we have got to get them in in, in August, early September. So we, we, we start off by working out where our overwintering crops are going to go, and we fill in our, our plan with them. Then we look at our, our summer fruiting crops, which are going to generate the most uh, money for us in the year, and that's tomatoes, cucumbers, uh, that type of thing. And we put them into the plan. Then we put the spring uh, crops in, and then we see what gaps we've got, see what we haven't missed, and fill in the gaps. So we do that every year. Uh, we write it all down, and uh, this is back to my previous occupation when uh, I used to be a management consultant is, Basically, we plan everything out, and by planning everything out, uh, I'm, I'm a believer, we're a believer, that uh, it lessens load. We love a tick list. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, so we, 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 we'll have a list of things to do every day, and we'll tick them off, and we find that rewarding. Uh, we've got a vision in mind as to w what we want to do, where, where we want to be, the types of things we want to grow, how we're going to grow it. And the other thing we do is, uh, as I said right at the start, we operate this as a business. So we very much do things on per square foot. Um, I picked that up from one of uh, Elliot Coleman's uh, uh, Wintman books, uh, where he, he set a target for uh, how, how much you want to get. So we set a target as to how much we want to uh, get from a revenue point of view per square foot inside a hoop house and outside as well and basically if, if, if a crop isn't um, providing that return we then have a question as to whether or not we're going to grow it again now the question the answer might well be yes because we like to grow that type of crop or we might decide not to grow it so for this year for the first year we're not going to grow potatoes this year uh, we just don't think it's uh, financially uh, rewarding enough to grow it. So we, we make decisions like that. Uh, we're always looking to expand our knowledge. You know, we, you know, there's a whole bunch of uh, information um, sources out there. You know, I mentioned Paul Flynn, who, who was, was a massive helper. Charles Dowden, 
uh, for ourselves in the UK, Charles is just uh, brilliant. Uh, he'll answer any questions. He's anybody in the UK. I would advise them to go on one of his courses. Um, Charles is in, inspirational. Uh, your podcast has been fantastic. I think it, virtually immediately after we dis made the decision to go on no dig, I discovered uh, your, your no till uh, podcast, and we, we've learned so much from the likes of, you know, um, you know Felix Hoffman when he was on, Jake Eldridge. Um, you know, we 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 picked up from JM. You know, we picked up from Elliot Coleman. Um, things, you know, we pick up things on Connor Crickmore, Daniel Mears, Ben Hartman. And one of the things I think we found is you're never going to find that ultimate book that's going to satisfy everything you need to know. You really need to get um, your information from a whole bunch of different areas uh, because. Nobody's going to write a book for you, your area, what you're trying to achieve. So what we try to do is pick something up from lots of different people. And then the other thing we do, which again uh, saves time, is we've got to learn from our mistakes. So, um, you know, if we, if we make a mistake, whether or not it's in, in growing something, whether or not it's in prepping a bed, whether or not it's to do with drainage, uh, we, we, we look to see why we've got a problem. What's caused the problem, and what can we do to stop that happening again? So I think Anne mentioned before, all this knowledge keeps you young as well. Yeah, I think that's great. I love that idea of like no one's going to write your book for you. You got to kind of piece it all together and figure it out for yourself and get your hands dirty. Yeah. Um, We've got your book on order, Jesse. So we've <laughs> got we've got high hopes for that. Oh well, yeah, I definitely wrote my book for you. That that doesn't count. Thank you. <laughs> Hey, you all just jumping in real quick to get a word from our sponsors like Tilth Soil. Tilth Soil makes NOP compliant living potting soils in Cleveland, Ohio with food scraps they haul and compost themselves. Each batch of soil is tested against the competitors and the results are in. Plants vote for Tilth Soil. To learn more about their full line of products, please visit TiltSoil.com. The show is also brought to you by you, the patrons. Our patrons at patreon.com slash no-till growers are the absolute best. I appreciate each and every one of you. If you love this show or if you love No-Till Flowers podcast or our videos or Growers Live or anything else that we do and you want to support it, go to patreon.com slash no-till growers and consider signing up. And at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs this week to Dallas Hayes, Christine Chan, Dan Fort, Rimmel Greenhouse Systems, Scott Snodgrass, Jody Miller, Shane and Emma of Aslan Organics, Travis and Heidi of Arcadia Acres, Jacob Arthur, Fiona and Donnie of Firefly Farm, Jean-Martin Fortier, and Yannick Laplante. Big thanks to our supporters and show sponsors and everyone who even just shares this show. It is a huge amount of work that goes into it, and we really appreciate all the support. All right, back to Bob and Ann. Okay, so I, I cut, you mentioned earlier you were talking about doing three quarters of an acre to an acre and a quarter. Um, do you want to take us through how that's how that is going to work out, or how you are um, how you are doing that transit or opening up that property? So what, one of the things we came we, we came to realize was there's various limits in, in what we can do. You know, there's only so much you can grow, but also there's only so much we can deliver. So we looked at the whole end-to-end -end process, and one of the things that we did was at the minute we're delivering boxes three days a week. We want to get that down to two days a week uh, maximum. And to that, we, we're going to have to buy... Uh, a delivery van and then when we worked out and we, we bought an electric van and one of the things we, we worked out was how many boxes we can deliver over two days and the answer we came to was 150 boxes then I mentioned that we, we sort of have worked out how much we can grow per square foot and what we can grow either in a polytunnel or uh, in an uncovered area uh, so we, we worked out 150 boxes was the most we can do. Then we worked out an average price of a box. And then we worked out how much revenue we need to generate. And basically, we then worked it back to how much land we'd need to grow the crops we, we'd need for 150 boxes a week for 50 weeks of the year. 
And what we came to was we needed a quarter of an acre of covered cropping and one acre of uncovered cropping. So we were sitting here at uh, a three quarters of an acre and we want to get up to an acre and a quarter. That we believe will give us enough ground to grow crops for that 150 boxes a week. We know that we can only deliver 150 boxes a week and it all sort of worked out what we needed. So we then looked at our land. I mentioned we had six and a quarter acres and we grow crops in, in two of the fields. But one of the things we then said was we're going to have to expand in another area. Now, the area where the orchard is, is a, is a big, is a really big field. It's three acres. It's three acres, yeah. Um, so we've got it's two areas in there, which are both about a quarter of an acre each. So we sort of measured, measured out what we needed and we looked at the land and we said, right, what do we need to do before we even started prepping this land? And a good time to do that is the winter time, because you can see where there's where there's drainage problems, where um, there might be any any issues with wind or whatever. So we, we, we've got these two areas. And the first thing we're going to do in both areas is put in some um, drainage pipes, because we, we have... We only have about uh, a foot of topsoil and then it's heavy clear. So we've had drainage problems in every area we, we've moved to. Uh, so we, we've learned how to put in drainage pipes. So we're going to put drainage pipes in, in both areas. Then what we're going to do is, uh, we mentioned before about how our approach to the turnip sawfly was to burn some of the area where we've been gathering um, wood, cardboard, um, cuttings off trees uh, over the last two or three months. And we've been building piles of um, things we can burn. And what we're actually going to do is once we put the drainage in, we're going to burn the area. We're going to set some fires off. And one of the things that we found best to get a good start is, is to, is to uh, burn uh, the weeds off. So we're going to burn the weeds off. And then we'll put a layer, six inch layer of compost. And what we found is that if you put a six inch layer of compost on the top, especially after if, if you've gone from reasonably bare ground where you've, you've burnt it off, um, you're going to suppress the weeds, uh, the weeds and you've got an instant area uh, to grow from. So we've worked out when we need to bring them online. Uh, so we've worked back from that as to when we need to get the compost from, when we need to put the drainage pipes in, when when we need to uh, do everything in every step. So it's basically trying to prep the land as much as we can from a drainage point of view, uh, burn off as many weeds as we can, put on a thick layer of compost, and then we're ready to go. The one thing, other thing we would do is we'll put a small fence around it because our biggest problem in this area is rabbits. Uh, so we, we'll we'll put a fence round, uh, and then as soon as we got down, we'll be planting straight into it. Now what we have found is we, we're planting to this year, but we found that uh, the compost, particularly green waste compost, which is the majority of what we use, it's at its best after about a year. So we will get things off it this year, but next year uh, we expect to get uh, a better rewards. Um, as I said that. Once a, a compost has been down a year, we find it to be at its best. Yeah, that makes sense. I've I've kind of noticed the same thing with with some of the compost that we use. That's a little mulchier. It's not quite maybe as nitrogenous as some of the others. Um, that it takes. Yeah, it takes like a, you really see the effects in year two. Um, are you? You said you were getting it some stuff off that plot. Do you know what that looks like? Like, what are your? Um, are you just gonna? Yeah. It's probably going to be our um, overwintering. overwintering. So we ideally want it all ready for um, August, and then we we'll oh. put overwintering um, brassicas. It's on the whiteboard. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so we, we find and we, some onions and some onions. So onions. we'll put, put onions and garlic in as well um, over winter. Uh, and as I say, that, that we found that if you get the compost death right, 
and the drainage right before you even start uh you you know you can usually grow some very very good stuff uh, and as i say from from our point of view going no till has been just a game changer as far as we're concerned i mean we wouldn't have given up on the previous way but it was hard to see uh how we were going to su succeed and i mentioned before that we had blind faith that we would succeed but without actually knowing how we were going to do it and what we found is no till gives us that approach gives us that approach and then by then putting on top of it the planning aspect that looking at everything from a square foot point of view uh, it just gives us that drive to make sure uh, we get the best amount of crops uh, and the best crops we can off, off an area yeah that's great i i like that and i like the um the idea of having the burn piles beforehand it kind of reminds me of like the terra preta stuff they do you know the with uh biochar and compost kind of layered together so we have tried previous uh methods so uh i, I know you guys use tarps a lot we what we used previously was wheat suppression fabric and we never found that particularly successful um it just seemed to suppress the weeds but as soon as you took the fabric off they just started growing again uh but from a weed suppression point of view the best thing we've ever done is putting six inches six inch layer of compost down and then we do that initially and then each year after that we look to put an inch or two inches on top of that just to freshen it up you have to get plants in though you must put a crop into yeah. the compost um which also adds to the effect of no weeds yeah and i like earlier you mentioned having garlic be one of your overwintering crops i think that's a great option because of the uh one, it has sort of an allopathic, allelopathic mm -hmm. effect, um, but it's a long season crop. It doesn't require a lot of nutrition right up front, especially over the winter. Um, that's kind of a perfect way to condition that soil, that compost layer. And it also, it, um, I think the overwintering crops are a great revenue generator. So, you know, we, we, we grow a lot of salad leaves over winter. We uh, do overwintering um, cabbages, overwintering uh, cauliflowers but having things like overwintering onions overwintering garlics in there um, if you can get them out in the sort of june july period there's still enough time to get something else in and you know overall we we get the target we want to try and achieve per square foot in terms of revenue we tend to do two crops a year outside and three crops a year in the hoop houses yeah, that's great. That's yeah, that's it's it's great to use that, utilize that space to start bringing an immediate cash cash flow. Yeah, um, and, and we use you know, I, I remember reading, uh, I think it was uh, one of James' book where we we make sure we get the plant density as as good as we can, so that uh, we give them enough space to grow. But what we do is grow them close enough so that uh, by the time the three quarters of their maturity they're sort of touching each other so of thing and that, that sort of uh coverage tends to keep the weeds down as well yeah the plant canopy is important are you what are you doing for pathways in uh in the in the hoop houses uh we use wood chip so i was interested in what you said on, on your video uh about wood chip we found uh again that uh it helps uh one of the things that we've identified is the row of crops that are planted nearest to the path tend to grow better. Uh, and we can only put that down to uh, the mycorrhizal fungi and, and everything that comes off uh, the wood chip. Uh, and we refresh our sort of wood chip pass once a year. Um, that's worked for us. Outside, we don't tend to uh, uh, have set paths in place. One of the things we don't do is we don't use 30 inch beds. So um, I know it's a, it's a bit, you know, lots of people say they use 30 inch beds and a, a lot of it comes from Elliot Coleman and things like that. But one of the things we noticed, what we set up a 24 foot wide uh, hoop house uh, a few years ago, and that allowed us to put seven 30 inch beds in and we had six one foot wide paths. And when we looked at it, we couldn't help thinking there's an awful lot of land being used for pathways. And 
So we actually moved to seven foot wide beds in, in the hoop houses. And our thinking is we have a ground level irrigation. We don't have many weeds. Uh, we, we, we saw a plant, what we're going to do. And there is very little need to get in and, and stand on, on, the, uh, on the beds until you're ready to harvest, you know, because, you know, as I say, we don't have many weeds. We, we have ground level irrigation inside uh, the polytons. We have overhead irrigation. And so we found that the best way to maximize what is uh, an expensive area, a hoop house, you know, you've invested a lot of money in buying hoop houses. We've got a quarter of an acre of them. And what we don't want is to have hoop houses full of paths. So uh, we, we've moved to seven foot wide beds in, in our in our hoop houses, and that has worked brilliantly for us. Uh, another thing that we don't do, uh, which I, I, I noticed you doing on the video this morning, we don't bother broad forking the area. One, what we found is that by employing a deep compost mulch system, uh, when we first started, we had very, very few worms. But now, just two years after having uh, this deep compost mulch system, we have so many worms it's it's you know you you lift a bit of uh uh ground some soil or some some compost and it's just teeming with worms so what we do is we let the worms uh integrate the soil into the compost we let the, the worms aerate um uh, the soil and it it's um we fa didn't find any need at all to broad fork so you know back to your earlier thing about what do we do to save time if we find something that we don't think is worthwhile for us and that, you know, it might be worthwhile for other people, uh, we eliminate it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, for, especially with something like the broad fork, like I think you're referencing that video that I made the other day. Um, yeah. the, I broad forked before I set up that bed because that area was super compacted from animal usage. Um, yeah. and that I found that in our context, like that, definitely helps get the bed established a little faster. Um, but and I think that's what I, everybody's got to realize it's what their context is Yeah, and go with it. And that, that's why I go back to get as much knowledge as you can from as many different sources as you can and pick out what's best for you. Um, but, you know, being aware of things like broad fork, it, you've still got to be aware of it. You've still got to be aware that that's a tool and an approach you can use. It just, doesn't make that much difference as far as we're concerned. Yeah. So back to the, so we have seven foot wide beds in the hoop houses. Outside, we don't have any set beds. We basically just, we have a, a big area of land and then we put the paths in for that season where um, where, 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 where the, uh, that particular crop ends. So it depends whether or not we've got onions, garlic, brassicas, uh, salad leaves, it, depends on how big a bed we want. And then we'll put the path in, in place. Wow. That's fascinating. Okay. So I definitely want to hear more about this. So the seven foot beds, your, what are you doing to get to the middle of those beds? Are you just kind of, is it, a, I, I guess if you have that much compost down, I know Charles Dowding doesn't mind walking on the bed sometimes. Um, but that's a pretty big stretch. Is that, are, are, do you have systems to kind of help you, uh, so we, walk over we, the beds or, in a hoop house, we'll have a seven foot bed, a one foot path, a seven foot bed, one foot path, seven foot bed. So we have two paths. And it's surprising if you get down on your hands and knees, how, how far you can stretch into one side. And, um, uh, you know, we, we do, I mean, uh, we do in the UK, we do regard Charles as being the guru. And, you know, we follow his approach. If we, we don't see any problem with walking on, on beds at all, Albeit we don't find many reasons to walk on beds during the, the grown part of the uh, the season. You know, we, we've got the irrigation sorted out. We have very few weeds. Um, if necessary, we can step over and, and, and look at look at a particular plant or do some weeding or whatever. But um, we're driven by the fact that if you if you've invested in a in a polytunnel, you're getting it set up. It's prime. Uh, growing space, you know, with uh, all, all our best crops come from our hoop houses because, as I mentioned earlier, we have live in a very wet and windy place. 
So, you know, we get some fantastic crops in uh, the polytunnels and why not maximize what you've got? As I said, we, we look at everything from a square foot point of view. So if, if we looked at a hoop house or we looked at a, an area outside, we'll try to make sure we utilize 90% of it. Yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm a big advocate for, for kind of reconsidering the 30 inch bed. I don't think it's bad for everyone. I think there's, there are advantages to the 30 inch bed in some cases, but I, the, the, the idea of managing that many pathways, like if you could eliminate even a few pathways in a garden plot, that's a huge amount of space you've opened up. Um, so that's how, that's how we actually started Jesse by, elim- we didn't move straight from 30 inch bed to, to seven foot beds. When, when I mentioned before, we had a seven, seven beds and six path, six paths in this, in this hoop house. And basically, you know, you have a situation where you have a 30 inch bed. Um, so you have a, a one foot path, a 30 inch bed, a one foot path, 30 inch bed, and a one foot path again. So basically we just took the middle path out first of all. And instead of having a 30 inch bed, you end up with having um, a six inch bed bed and you know it's easy you know from either side you can easily manage a six foot bed and then we, we looked at it and thought actually why don't we just go for seven seven foot beds because we can manage that as well i'd like to know a little bit more about how you do that in the field so i know i know you said they weren't set in the field so you're basically making a plan for how much food you need yeah. and then you're building out the beds in the garden based on that plan is that do I have that uh, right? So, so we we know how many cabbages we got we've got to uh, grow, how many celeriac, how many leeks, uh, how many um, um, various other plants we, we need to grow, and basically we will put in a bed of say three hundred cabbages, and they, they, that might be uh, five rows of of sixty cabbages. So we will put all the cabbages together leave a space, put the onions in, leave a space, um, put the lettuces in, that type of thing. So we, we, we're driven by what do we need to grow rather than letting the uh, land determine how how and where we grow it. Interesting. So one, one bed could be in a slightly different spot the following year. Like those yes. beds are not going to stay in the same place. That's right. So, um, so, so and we've just got to keep an eye, uh, you know, be aware of what we had in, in that area in the previous year. But you, you get to know your land, you get to know uh, where you've put things, and we do try to we try we do adhere to a crop rotation uh, as well. That's why you need a good plan at the beginning of the seasons. Yeah, I think that's so interesting. Having the crops dictate the bed width and not necessarily the bed width dictate what, how many crops you can grow of a certain thing. And, that, you know, I, I, you get other people want to do it a different way, but we found this way works for us. It allows us to maximize the land. Uh, and the combination of that and the deep compost mold system, uh, we've had some fantastic results this year. What happens in a situation where the bed is in the same place as a pathway from the previous season? Like, are you doing anything to break up that compaction from the pathway? Um, oh, we haven't. We just put we just put compost down. Okay. We don't we don't find that it it's that compacted. You know, it's um in our experience, you you you, you the end elements, the worms and everything else. You, you know, they're great. They're doing the job for us. Once you put your um in your fresh compost layer on, right. You've got, you know, the, the worms underneath are all doing the job for you. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that, that, that uh, land beneath the surface, that, that sort of soil structure, we have noticed a huge difference since we stopped digging the soil. Um, some some plant, like, for instance, we grow, I don't know if you have them in the States, we grow Jerusalem artichokes. Yeah, yep. Uh, and when, when we harvest them, you know, because they're deep into the ground, and when we harvest them, we can see how much the, uh, the soil, the clay, and the compost have all been integrated. Uh, it's amazing what's, what's happened to our soil. It's, it's really transformed it. Have there been any things that haven't done well in that system? Like, have you note? Have you? 
I mean, I think it's always helpful for people to hear of, in, of any things that didn't work um, as much as things that did. Is there anything like within that system that you learned a big lesson on? Uh, where we, the biggest lesson we've learned is getting the right depth of compost. So when, when we first uh, laid out the uh, outside uncovered cropping area, uh, I, I used a tractor, uh, we used a trailer, and we basically uh, used the tractor and the trailer to, to, to spread the compost. And what we found when the following growing season, we didn't get the depth consistent. Some areas we had just one inch of compost, some areas were at four inches, some areas were at six inches. And one of the things we realized was if you don't get your depth of compost right, don't expect to get really good, uh, really good crops. So to us, so the way we made the beds in the hoop houses, which we did by using uh, wheelbarrows, is the best way to make it. Now it might sound, I talked about before about saving time and saving work, but making the making sure you've got a good start, you've got the right depth of compost, is absolutely crucial if anybody wants to follow a no-till uh, approach. The other thing that we learned as well last year is on one of the new outside areas, we had um, summer and winter squash. And the summer last year was a very wet summer. And we had a patch which just puddled of water. And that area didn't grow, so not as well as the, the surrounding area. So that we put a... Um, a drain pipe in this year and fingers crossed that'll be much better next year but it's yeah you, you do you it's the elements that dictate where your issues are and the elements could be a, a rabbit a mole or drainage and another thing we've learned um, where things don't work is if you don't get things in at the optimum time mm. basically if, if you want to grow uh any sort of crop, it will need enough time to, to grow. It needs enough time to uh, do what it has to do. And it's Just absolutely that. crucial that you get things in on time. So that goes back to we've planned out everything for the next 15 months. So we know when uh, our overwintering crops have got to be in. We know when our uh, tomatoes have got to be in. We know when we can start and put our, our spring crops in. And if you miss those dates, you're likely to have not as good a cropping as you, as you could achieve. So to us, that's one of the crucial things. I mean, gardening, when, when you boil it down, it's very simple. Get your soil right. Make sure you've got good drainage. Put things in on time and be able, make sure you, you irrigate things and protect yourself against uh, uh, pests and diseases. I've said that in one sentence. It's a lot more difficult than that, but um, that's the key thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I, 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 I think those are really important uh, factors. Um, I want to ask you, there's a Patreon question uh, from Matthew Clifford who mentioned that you're almost 55 degrees north. I didn't double check that, but that probably sounds about right. You're similar to southern Alaska um, in terms of your your uh, your where you are on the globe. Um but with high rainfall and humidity, he said it would be interesting to hear, uh, you know, your all's approach to winter farming in relation to low light levels and high humidity. And, and if no-till has improved that a little bit with a rain splash and disease and that sort of stuff. Yeah. I mean, the, um, you, you've got to find out what you can grow over winter and it gets back to, to, you know, we've got a set of crops. We know we can, we can uh, grow over winter and it's also we also know what we can grow in the summer and autumn and store for for uh, you know so you know things like sweet things like beetroot potatoes you, you, you can actually store them for for several months uh, squashes you can store so it's making sure you've got enough things growing during the summer and the autumn to make sure you can store them over winter that's your first point. And then uh, we know we can grow things uh, over winter in the hoop houses. Um, 
and that helps an awful lot. We've got a quarter of the acre I've covered cropping, and that's that's been hugely important for us. And for the stuff outside, you know, we we do grow things like onions, garlic, uh, some brassicas outside as well. So it's it's about knowing what you can grow in your area. Outside, we do offer some part protection by putting over fleece or or sort of uh, I'm not sure if you call them low tunnels, where they're about a foot, a foot and a half high, that type of tunnel. Uh, so we do put them on as well. And is that plastic? That's just row cover, right? Or is that plastic? Uh, netting. Net, netting. Oh, okay. Net, netting and fleece we use. And yeah, it's funny with winter growing, you know, some people make this uh, mistake of thinking of winter growing as growing. And, and like you said, it's really just stalling the, the plant. You, you, you know, you grow it till it's kind of ready. And then it's, it's really just winter harvesting, winter keeping alive. So what, one of the things we've been really successful at is what we call, I don't know if they call them the same in the States, spring cabbage and spring cauliflowers, which we've got to get, if we get them into the ground late August, early September, uh, come March, April, May, we have the most amazing cabbages and cauliflowers. Uh, we're overwintering leeks this year. Over in, in some uh, beetroots, trying that out, and it's trying to find out what will overwinter. Uh, you know, we've got our shallots in, our, our onions in, our garlic in. We've got purple sprouting broccoli. We've got um, all the mustards, the leaves, um, the lettuces. Um, with those cauliflower, are you you're planting those in the tunnel? Yeah. In the fall. Yeah. Um, and then you're not getting ahead on those at all until the spring, or they're heading up and then they're holding on the plant. No, they they um they will they will form a head in the spring. Now, talking of the cauliflowers, we were never ever able to grow cauliflowers till two years ago, and it goes back to this lovely Paul from the Soil Association, who looked at our uh, soil analysis. Now, I can't pronounce the names. I'm going to pass you over to Bob to pronounce the names. But we had elements which were not in our soil. And he suggested that the, that was the reason why we couldn't grow the cauliflowers. So we placed um, volcanic rock dust. Now, you put a lot of supplements into your um, ground, Ours is volcanic rock dust. So that's what we're using as addition. And what we were short of was short of boron and molybdenum. And uh, you know, so we, we've we've looked at it and, and, and say we we've got a supply of what's called volcanic rock dust, which is lots and lots of minerals in it. And we found that's benefited uh, our grown hugely. Yeah, that's great. Those micronutrients are really, especially molybdenum. I mean, that's one that you end up. You know, in terms of photosynthesis, it's a critical, critical element. Um, yeah, I mean, making sure that's one thing I tell people, like you don't have to necessarily add every mineral in the world or try and get them perfectly in balance. But if something's completely missing, that's a, that can provide a huge issue for your plant growth. The I'm curious, like, OK, so I just want to make sure I have it with the cauliflower. So you're planting this in the spring or in the fall. You're the letting fall. it overwinter. Is it is it in a heated tunnel or is it just unheated? Hoop house. Is it covered over the winter? Uh, it depends. Some, at the moment, it has fleece on it. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. I've never done cauliflower that way, but I really want to try it now. <laughs> and and it, it's worked for us. Uh, you've got to get, make sure, like everything, you've got to make sure you get the right variety. Yeah, what's um, your variety? Uh, it's a medallion or snowball. It's medallion. Medall from a UK point of view, they're called medallion. And is it a long, I'm assuming it's a longer season cauliflower? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But we get, I mean, we, we've been fairly successful in growing summer and autumn cauliflowers, but our spring cauliflowers are absolutely huge. Yeah, that's great. I, I feel like that's a crop that a lot of people struggle with just because, you know, you have pests and I'm always interested in stuff that you can grow really early in the spring before the pests really get out there. Um, maybe you'll have aphids or something in the, in the, in the tunnel, but generally the, uh, yeah, if you can avoid the worms and the harlequin looking beetles and that sort of stuff, uh, of the summer, then yeah, that's great. I love that. Um, well, the, all the brassicas that we put out, we always put a, um, a ring 
around each base uh, to prevent cabbage root fly. What's the ring? Um, so it basically it's it's just it's 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 if you if you plant something and it's just a little cover that you put around the base of uh, the stem. Uh, we, we get a lot of what's called cabbage root fly. I'm not sure if it's the same sort of thing. And the cabbage root fly comes along and it lays its eggs at, at the base of um, the stem. If you put these little covers on, what it does is it will lay its eggs on the, um, on the cover and then you'll have some other insect or beetle will come along and eat them. So it, it doesn't stop them, but what it does it creates a mechanism where something else will eat them. So we use that. Um, and because we're organically certified, we've, we've got to look for opportunities like that to make sure that, um, you know, we're controlling pests and diseases without using chemicals and pesticides. It's just a cardboard ring, basically, yeah. that, which, which has got a, um, a, a slit along the radius so you can hook it round. So we put them around all brassicas. And all I can say is, from our point of view, that one year we forgot that, or we didn't have time to do it, we got attacked by the cabbage root fly, um, where we put those uh, collars on. Uh, we've never had a problem with them. Yeah, that's great. I love that little detail. Uh, I had not heard of that. So that's, uh, yeah, that's super cool. Um, Bob and Ann Patton, Thank you so much for your time. This has been just such a great conversation. Uh, thanks very much, Jesse. We, we listen to your, uh, your podcast every week and it, you've been a, a great help. And the people you've interviewed, we've taken something away from everyone. So hopefully somebody will take something away from the way we approach things. All right, if you enjoyed that show, make sure to follow Bob and Ann on Instagram at, at Hexhamshire Organics or check out their site www.hexhamshireorganics.co.uk. Make sure to subscribe to our new podcast, No Till Flowers, and binge that show if you have not already. This is the last week of episodes, and it's a good it's a good one. Also, make sure to subscribe to the new Growers Live feed. It's in your podcast networks, wherever you get them. That is the bi-monthly live show hosted by Josh Satin at the No-Till Growers YouTube channel. While you're doing all that good subscribing, make sure to subscribe to this podcast as well, wherever you are getting it and leave a review. But this week, all reviews must include the lyrics to go along with my theme song. Mine are, this is the jam. It's the jammy jam, jammy farm. I feel like it needs some work. Huge thanks, as always, to Jackson Roulette and Josh Satin for their help. Thanks to Willie Jammy Jam Breeding for the theme music. Huge thanks to my wife, Hannah Crabtree, fellow farmer, raiser of children, illustrator of my book. Fun fact. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye. Good luck with your new farm. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's uh, we're, we're very much looking forward to it, um, you know, to getting this thing kind of uh, built out and we got a new tunnel going up soon and, um, yeah, got to build up all of our beds and, and, uh, oh, so how much, how much crop and area are you planning on, on focusing on for this year? It'll be about three quarters of an acre for this year. And then next year, I, I don't know. Well, we may go up to about an acre. Um, if we really pushed it on this property, we could get about two full acres opened up. Um, I don't think we'll do that, but you know, I, I'm more and more attracted to the idea of kind of bringing in a second family. So if we ever find something that could work where we could have a more of a collaborative farming situation, um, then we would have, then we'd probably want to open up more, a little bit more acreage. Um, but I mean, we can do quite a bit on three quarters of an acre, an acre. So right. Absolutely. I mean, there's a huge amount. I mean, uh, one thing that surprised us is how much you can get out of a small area of land. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's amazing what you can, if, if your timing is good and you don't have to deal with weeds and you're not having to flip over beds or that sort of stuff so quickly. Um, yeah, no, it's great. It's amazing what you can do on small acreage and I'm with you on the bed expansion. I was actually thinking about doing the video for next week on why I'm ditching the 30 inch bed. <laughs> yeah, oh, too, yeah. Too many paths, too many paths. It's so many paths. <laughs>